Welcome back to another episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. This time around, we will be reviewing the fifth episode of the Exorcist TV series, second season, entitled, There But For The Grace Of God Go I. Before I begin, let me say that, as usual, there will be spoilers incorporated throughout this analysis from both Season 1 and Season 2. But before we get into the meat of our analysis, let me say without question, without a doubt, folks, this series, as I said before in a previous video, just keeps getting better and better, going from strength to strength. The Exorcist TV series is one of the finest shows on television right now. For my part, I will say that it is even better than some of the other shows that I watch right now, such as The Walking Dead, such as The Orville, and this Star Trek Discovery thing that I have quit watching altogether. The Exorcist is taking the cake, hands down in my opinion. Just had to put get that out of the way. I'm really loving this show. It is one of my favorite on TV right now. So with that being said, let's get to the meat of our analysis. So we open up this episode where, where we left off before in the previous episode. And what we see here is that Verity has discovered that Grace is not real. And she has followed Andy up to the room where he was. She's taken a look around and she's seen all of this derelict stuff left sitting in the room. But there's no sign whatsoever of a little girl or a little girl's room in any shape, fashion, or form. It is reasonable to assume this was actually Andy's wife, Nicole's room, okay? And this is where she did a lot of her artistry, a lot of her artwork and other things of this nature. And there's some things that are pointed out specifically in this room that we see focused on throughout this episode that I'm going to come back to a little bit later on. Verity finds uh, Andy in the room or she, he comes back into the room, should I say, and she talks to him and asks him, who is he talking to? Because from her perspective, there is no one there but him and her. Andy snaps out of his illusion that has been you know, fixed into his mind by the, by the demonic entity. He gets short and very confrontational with Verity and asks her why she's in there in the first place and why he can't have a place of his own in this entire house to grieve for his wife. Now, the question I had with this was, how long has Nicole been dead? It's indicated that in the show that he married Nicole some 14 years ago. But the question of how long she's been dead, at least from what I have seen so far, has not been answered. So the grieving process to me seems to be a little bit awkward here, that he's still grieving for a wife that he's lost, I don't know, how long has it been? One year ago? Two years ago? Four years ago? Five years ago? We don't know how long this is. But the grieving process takes a natural course to it where over time a person, unless something is very seriously wrong psychologically or perhaps with other factors, a person gets over the loss of a loved one and they continue on with life. So the question becomes why Andy, if he has gone through a normal grief cycle, has not at this point gotten over the loss of Nicole and tried to move on with his life. Well, one of the obvious answers has to be that there is demonic influence here going on in the storyline. But could there be some other instance or some other issue that the demon is taking advantage of to use this against Andy and to keep him from passing through the normal stages of the grief process and moving on with his life? So, as Verity is forced out of the room or kicked out of the room by Andrew. Uh, Andy is bitten by some kind of insect that uh, obviously is under supernatural control or maybe is in fact supernatural itself in origin, which bites him on the, on the chest. He proceeds after that to stumble out of the room or should I say walk out of the room after he sees Grace again saying that you're not real and then she confronts him on the steps asking him where he's going and he runs down the steps and runs away saying you're not real and that's pretty much the end of the opening section of the show so what we see here is that things like the presence of flies bees wasps 
things like this. These are all common motifs in horror shows. And so when we see Andy being bitten by this insect, this is not something that actually surprised me, but it's something that I hope that this particular show does not use too often as a as an environmental, if you will, uh, or an atmospheric uh, to kind of show us that we're dealing with a uh, the presence of supernatural power because I really like this show to try to keep its own uniqueness, its freshness, uh, its takes on the, a lot of these things where it doesn't use a lot of, for example, jump scares and other things like that. Some of the more dumb things that we see commonly used in a lot of scary movies today. Uh, and this, the Exorcist TV series, has tried to push those things away and take it more advantage of the psychological aspects of what's going on. And I really appreciate that. So I hope we don't see a lot of refrain back to a lot of these common commonalities that we normally see in a lot of other horror movies and TV shows. Because of what he sees upstairs, Andy decides spontaneously, suddenly, out of the blue, just to go camping and get out of the house on the anniversary of him asking Nicole to marry him 14 years ago on that same day, all right? And he tells Rose that he just thinks it would be a great idea for everybody to get out of the house everybody to go camping and get a fresh perspective on things and you know kind of become one with nature if you will well it's really more about Andy than it is about anybody else in the house it's really more about him seeing race uh, and it's more about him seeing her now all over the place where before she was just kind of appearing to him in certain sections of the house before that is the last episode where she finally came outside this, of course, was the demon's effort to dupe him into sticking with her, or it, if you will, in the presence or in the form of grace. But now she's just appearing everywhere kind of randomly at will just to kind of keep him, quote unquote, on his toes, if you will, and to let him know that she, the demon that is, is angry with him because it, he is defying her and he's breaking free from her psychologically and moving more towards Rose and the rest of the kids. This is something, of course, that the demon doesn't like. It's losing its grip on him. It's losing the stronghold it has in its mind. And now it's going to fight for that stronghold to be resecured so that whatever its purposes and plans are, they, these things can be accomplished. Let's move on from there to Rose meeting with Tomas. He comes back to the house to try to talk with Rose and he almost immediately upon coming into the house and sitting down with Rose once again has feelings of demonic occupation going on in the house. He asks Rose about any unusual happenings, anything, about any, anything strange going on in the house, people acting weird or out of the ordinary. She does not tell him about any of the experiences that she's seen so far, and we know that she's seen some things, but as a rational individual, Rose more than likely is putting these things out of her mind as just being strange things that she really cannot explain, but that, that there must be some kind of natural explanation for, and so she's not really being that concerned about it. You remember in the last episode where the... Uh, the shadow being came to her in the middle of the night while she was sleeping. She dismissed that as a dream, even when she jumped up from her bed after hearing Harper scream and stepped into that, I don't know what that substance was on the floor, but she was wide awake even at that time, and she still managed to dismiss that as being part of a dream sequence or something. So Rose, just like most rational individuals, is trying to rationalize away the experiences that she's seen in the house. Therefore, I will not rely on supernatural ideas to explain these things. So when Tomas comes to her and asks her this question, she says to him, what does she say to him? We just got through convincing Harper that demons don't exist. Notice what she says in that, in that scene. She says demons don't exist. In other words, what Rose is telling the audience, us, and Tomas through that one simple sentence is, the supernatural is not really an element of my life and it's not really an element of how I think and I appreciate what you believe, Father Tomas, but your line of thinking really does not enter into this equation. And so I'm a rational being, 
I want to keep things on a rational basis. So she dismisses Tomas kindly, if you will, but she really dismisses him from the house and says, thank you, but no thank you. Quite frankly, I, I think, you know, as a social worker, she turns me the wrong way because she, can, she is constantly showing herself to be pretty much a functionary who believes that the state has the power and should have the power to determine a lot of these types of matters. She doesn't seem to be able to look outside of the boundaries, look outside of the lines of what do the regulations and the rules say, what does the state and the power of the state empower me as a social worker to do and to how to respond to these situations. We saw this when she went to Harper Graham's home and when Marcus comes out to confront her, uh, she asks him what he's doing there and he tells her he doesn't have to tell her anything and she says, well, the state says differently and she much proceeds to march off to get into her car and say that she's going to have the police coming. We see this again when Truck is strangling Verity and when this is finally stopped, what does Rose do? She says there are procedures we have to follow to report this to certain, certain authorities. Truck can't go back to the house, blah, blah, blah. And she definitely believes that this is something that she is empowered to do, which of course she is, but she definitely believes that this is something that she should be empowered to do in order to protect kids, obviously. These things are right, but what I'm suggesting to you is, does she have the ability to look outside of those lines and make judgments that do not require the power of the state to intervene. So that's why she's kind of turned me the wrong way. So we move on from there to see Grace once again confronting Andy alone in his room as he's packing up his things to go camping. And he makes her angry because he is ignoring her and still believing that this is some kind of psychotic episode, or should I say some type of psychological episode going on in his mind. Andy, like Rose, shows himself to be an individual throughout the series so far, a rational individual who does not believe in anything that is not explainable by science and by psychology. And he is a trained psychologist, as you may remember from the previous episodes. So the ideas of things being supernatural or things being outside of, nat outside of nature, this does not appeal to Andy and he lets people know this, including Shelby, when he says oh, that although he respects Shelby's beliefs, it is quite clear that he does not share Shelby's beliefs in supernatural ideas or supernatural phenomena. So when he is confronted by Grace once again, we as the audience know that we are dealing with something that is abnormal, something that is outside of the normal boundaries of nature. But Andy, as a skeptic and as a rationalist type person, does not accept this and he believes that she is some type of illusion that he is projecting into his own existence, into his own mind. Now we still don't know whether or not Grace is the is a manifestation of the unborn or perhaps deceased child that he and Nicole did have or may have had. It is my conjecture that she is and this projection of her is what the demon is using to project itself into his mind. Andy makes Grace angry by ignoring her and trying to push her away and tell her he doesn't want anything to do with her. And she says to him, you should be careful, Daddy. And then Andy you know, gets this pain on, the, on his chest again and he opens up his shirt to see his, his, the upper part of his left chest covered with these sores where this in insect looks like a wasp of some kind emerges and crawls on his face towards his eye Basically, that's Grace's way of saying, you know, if you upset me enough, I will punish you, I will hurt you. So we move on from there to see Marcus talking to old woman Powell at this nursing home or this retirement home, and he's asking her things about her dad and what happened in the 1950s when her father basically killed her entire family and she is the only remaining survivor. survivor. And he actually also, in an attempt to kill her, actually kills members of another family where she was having a sleepover in the 1950s. And she basically says to Marcus that uh, whatever was inside of her father, her father was a good man, he was a kind man, he was a very loving man, he loved his, all of his kids. She says that whatever was inside her father wore him like a cheap suit. She doesn't call it a demon, but she does believe, and she never changed her story throughout all these 60 some odd years, that 
what was inside of her father definitely was something else. It was not him. It was not a psychological break. He was not a, a person prone to violence. So it was not something that he just hid him inside of himself all this time and then it all of a sudden manifested. No, it was something else. She also says that he never spoke any other languages when Marcus asked did he speak any other languages? She says no and, and further tells Marcus that he barely got out of eighth grade. Marcus sees these as evidences of demonic possession and he then proceeds to talk to Tomas on the telephone and basically tells him that 50 to 60 some odd years ago this man Glenn Powell murdered his family and he did it under demonic control. We move on from there to see Bennett and Mouse deciding to head back to the United States. Bennett in this scene that we see him and Mouse in though is still trying his best to exercise Dolores Navarro. Now it perplexed me actually to see this from the beginning because Devin Bennett is a man of experience and he is a man of vast knowledge. He himself is a trained exorcist but it looks like he was falling back obviously on what happened to Angela Rance in season one and he was using that as the basis to say if she can be saved then Dolores Navarro can be saved. But finally he finally accepts the truth, accepts the reality and he kills her with the holy water that is given to him by Mouse. So they're moving on to go after the conspiracy and principally to go after Maria Walters back in the United States. So it looks to me like we're going to see the next time we see Mouse and Bennett, they're going to be back inside the continental United States, perhaps in Chicago. And so I am expecting at some point perhaps to see the return of Maria Walters. Okay, so we move on from there to see that Andy encounters Grace once again, this time in the woods where everybody is camping. And he, again, he believes her to be, to be the result of some kind of psychological stressor. Okay, in this case, that would be the death of his wife. So when he sees this, he thinks she is some kind of illusion, some strong delusion of his own mind, that is. And so he does not accept that she is actually there. And what he is seeing is not just some projection of his own brain. It is a projection, but it's not a projection of his own making. It's a projection of designs outside of his own understanding of reality. So... Because he continues to reject her, Grace that is, the demon decides to attack the rest of the family. It influences Truck by way of causing him to sleepwalk to the old witch's house. And this is something that I had said before when we first saw Truck sleepwalking, sleep that is. Can he be made susceptible to demonic influence because he is a sleepwalker? And can his mind be at a, such a low state of awareness that the demon can use that to influence him to do its bidding? And apparently, even when he is not in that low state of awareness, we saw the demon in this episode put him into that low state of awareness and cause him to go to the old witch's house and from there begin to bang his head profusely against the wall, even to the to the extent of causing him ble to bleed. Marcus and Peter, we move on to this scene, Marcus and Peter, that is Peter Osborne, the man from the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, they are on his boat out on the lake and they're exchanging PTSD stories. Now Peter reveals that he is a veteran who's seen kids die and then specifically he's, uh, there was a kid that, he's, uh, uh, that he saw die in Kosovo who haunted him in his dreams. I don't think this is a result of demonic influence. I just think this is a result of seeing the harsh realities of war. Marcus reveals his own PTSD stories, if you will. He reveals his own PTSD stories from the time that he was a child when he watched his father kill his mom and he killed his father with his father's own gun. He talks about Gabriel, the young boy he lost in Mexico City to what was the demon's name who was inside of Gabriel? Uh, the Baptist, as it called itself. We saw him talking about Harper, whom we've just seen in the last couple of episodes, being abused by her own mom, trying to make Harper think that she was actually possessed when she never was in the first place. We go on from there to see that Tomas has decided once again not to listen to Marcus. Once again, he's going to do his own thing. He's going to act on his own impulses, his own ideas, and he's not going to listen to the voice of experience. He goes back to the house at night when Marcus told him to go in the daytime and that they would go together. He goes back to the house at night. 
He's snooping around and once again, the demon knows that he's there. It shuts off the power in the house. All the lights are off. He's there in the dark. He can't see a single thing. And you got things bumping in the house, things um, banging in the house, all kinds of things that the demon is doing to distract him, to frighten him, to make him feel uncomfortable and unsafe, and to basically to throw him off balance. Tomas looks at the handprints on the wall, and it looks like he's focusing on an area where you don't see a handprint. And I was wondering for myself, was this a handprint that was painted over? And could it possibly have been Nicole's handprint that was painted over, if that was the case? We see him uh, moving on to, uh, you know, moving on to other parts of the upstairs room and then he looks up and he sees the moldy ceiling with all of the the stains and stuff on it that's one another sign in in a lot of these types of shows of demonic infestation looking like they have these these stains that just won't come out tomas moves on and then we see that the turntable activates by itself earlier in the season we saw this happening when caleb was playing music backwards i think it was episode three of this season and rose walks up the stairs and sees him doing this and then he looks like he stops for a moment, looks her way, and we know Caleb is blind, but as if he sensed her, and perhaps he was under con the control or influence of the demon when he was doing this, and when he sensed her, he stopped doing it, and then she turned and walked away. So we see this happening once again when Tomas is upstairs by himself, and this is once again is evidence of the demon looking like it's trying to throw him off balance. We go forward from there to see once again that Truck is banging his head against the wall inside of the witch's house under demonic influence. And Verity finds him and she tries to intervene and as a consequence gets choked out. Truck lifts her up, up off the ground and throws her against the wall and starts banging her head against the wall and of course he's still choking her. Now I think that the strength that Truck had to lift her up against the wall came from the demo demon's influence of him uh, under its control. I don't think that Truck, even with his as big as he is, had the strength to lift Verity up off the ground with one arm and then start banging her against the wall, in, especially in his in the state that he was in. As this is all going on, we get back to Tomas inside the house, inside the foster family house. He is he is now marching through the house. He's now found um, Nicole's room where she did all of her artistry stuff. And now he's focusing on the owl painting. This is the second time that this owl painting, by the way, is focused on in the story. The first time is when we see Verity confronting Andy at the beginning of the story. Now we see it being focused on once again near the end of the story. What is the significance of this owl painting? Then we see Tomas focusing on a rock on the ground that looks like it has some water or something on it. What is the significance of that rock? It is at this point that Tomas tells the demon to show itself to him, once again doing exactly what Marcus told him not to do, not to let the demon, a demon, inside his head. He does it anyway, once again suggesting to me that Tomas's impetuousness and his desire to act upon his own impulses is very strong and is something that is going to be very difficult for Marcus to control in the end, even though Marcus at this point believes that Tomas's visions led them to the island. Tomas lets this demon inside of, of his head and so he begins to have visions at this point of what has happened and how this demon has been influencing people uh, to kill members of their own family throughout a certain period of time on the island. This goes from uh, a man killing his family it looks like somewhere in the late 1800s or the early 1900s a man killing his whole family and then shooting himself in the head with a shotgun. He uses the words Eternum Vale. And then we go from there to, uh, it looks like the 1920s, the 1930s, and I'm guessing this because of the period of the dress, uh, the style of clothing that is that, that were being worn. Uh, and I'm guessing this because of the, of the kind of the car that we see in the background. It looks like it's a car that was made in the early 1920s, 1930s. Uh, and, and we see a woman pushing her son into the water well, which is, I believe at this point is the genesis of the witch story of the woman who would poison kids and then push them down a well, a water well. I think that's the genesis of that. And then we move on from there to the 1950s where a man in a suit, a modern suit from uh, the 20th century, killed, has already killed his family and then pulls out a chain and then 
bursts into a uh, into another house to kill his only remaining daughter and kills other people's family members in the process he too utters the words eternum vale before he begins to you know continue this killing spree now eternum vale from my uh from my understanding uh is a word or words they are latin of course but they're words that mean farewell forever what this means in the context of this i'm not entirely sure i've taken a guess uh it seems to me that perhaps uh farewell forever in this case is is saying something to the degree of goodbye forever to those family members who have been killed by these people under demonic influence but I, it's to me it's got to be a bit deeper than that so i'll wait for a little bit of a more of an explanation those of you who may want to chime in on that feel free uh, so that's what happens with that. So I think we're dealing with a demon here that has been around this island for a very long time, tormenting, torturing, and killing people, okay? I don't think this is something that has just occurred in the last 50 years or 60 years or so. From the 1950s to now would be about 60 some odd years. If we're talking about 1950 itself, that's 67 years. Uh, and even if this occurred, the last killing occurred in, let's say, 1955, right? Let's just say that. That would be 62 years that this demon has been on this island. And from what it looks like these visions of Marcus was shown, this demon has been on this island killing people for longer than that. Maybe even possibly a century or more, okay, from what I can see. So this demon has been occupying this island for a very long time, despite what Marcus says to Tomas when he says that in his experience, he doesn't believe a demon would be hanging around that long. Well. Folks, 50 years is nothing to an entity that exists outside of time and space as we understand it. That's, that's, I mean, that's a long time to us, but to a demon? I mean, come on, this is a creature that is supposed to exist in eternity with God. Do you really think 50 or 60 or 100 years means anything to them? I mean, Pazuzu waited, how long did he wait? He waited 40 years for Angela Rance to grow up and have kids of her own, a family of her own, before he decided to exact his revenge against her for what happened when she was a 12-year-old girl. So, I mean, think about this. 50 years is nothing. 60 years, or whatever, however long time this demon has been on this island, this doesn't mean anything as far as that's, you know, as far as that's concerned to a, a creature of this type of existence. We move on from there to see uh, that... Marcus is still with uh, Peter Osborne on his boat in the lake, and he, it looks like he's praying, and he, as he comes out of his prayers, he seems to be in a kind of a blissful type of elated state, and he seems like he has somehow or another, Master Jedi Marcus Keene has reconnected with the Force, that is, reconnected with God, and he's gotten some kind of answer to his prayer or his contemplation or whatever was going on. Now, I call him Master Jedi Marcus Keene because in my previous video, I said that I kind of compared Marcus and his, his kind of depressed state and his kind of lost, quote-unquote, lost state to a Jedi that has lost his connection to the Force. And so, I kind of compared him in that sense to uh, maybe Luke Skywalker or something like that. So, I call him Master Jedi Marcus Keene because it looks like perhaps he, maybe he's reconnected with God and somehow maybe God is giving him some answers to something that uh, questions that he was looking for and now he is behaving as if okay I've gotten my source I've gotten back reconnected to the source I've gotten the power back I'm ready to march on back to war Peter asks him what answer did you get Marcus's answer is nothing at all now this could be me this could mean any number of things it could mean that he didn't get a reply from God or it could mean that was God's reply. Nothing at all. In other words, Marcus asked a question and God's answer was nothing at all. And that's what he repeated to Peter. We don't know yet. Well, we were just going to have to see. So the final scenes, the final parts of the story. Andy drives up to the house with a very injured Verity who she, she thought he was going to take her to the hospital. That's not why, That's not what winds up happening. He goes back into the, you know, drives back to the house. He, he basically jams upstairs to Nicole's room and he starts destroying everything in his path and saying, why are you hurting my family? And then he takes the stone. This is the second time we've seen the stone, people. And then he throws it through the owl painting, which is the third time we've seen that owl painting and we focused in on it as the audience. 
What is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of these two objects? As he throws the stone through the painting, we see somebody behind it kind of rise up with the pillow slip over the case, that very strange looking weird pillow slip that Grace always wore. It's obviously not Grace, it's an adult. And it's revealed that it's his ex, that is deceased wife, Nicole Kim. And she just, you know, kind of looks at him and that's where the story ends. Folks, I can't tell you, I have to say that this show is awesome, okay? I, I can't stress enough, I guess how much I love this freaking show. <laughs> this show is great. Support this show, tweet about it, blog about it, share videos about it. Let the producers of this show know and let the, the, the let Fox itself know that you like The Exorcist and you want quality material like this to keep coming. Vote for this show and fight for this show. So I'm going to be looking forward to watching the next episode, Dear Nikki. I am unexpectedly making reviews once again on virtually every episode right now. Uh, I did not expect to do that, but I'm just so compelled. I'm compelled. <laughs> uh, really having fun making these videos and sharing my thoughts with you. So until next time, Exorcist fans, we'll see you then.